Well, thank you for inviting me back to Montana. I spoke here a couple of years ago, and uh, I want to congratulate uh, Carl on the great work that the Montana Policy Institute has, has accomplished in the last couple of years. It's emerged as a, as a major factor in policy in this state. <clears throat> I enjoyed my drive up here from Colorado. I always enjoy driving in Montana. I'm not sure I'm going to enjoy my drive back tomorrow in the snowstorm, but this, is a, this was a beautiful trip up here. I want to talk about Montana's deficit. Now, you've heard of a $400 million deficit, and that's a big problem. But let me suggest that the real problem in Montana is not this short-run $400 million that you're going to have to address in this legislative session. The real deficit problem in Montana is what we call a structural deficit, the long-run deficit, the long-run excess of expenditures over revenue. The Government Accounting Office estimates that the states are looking at roughly a $10 trillion deficit over the next 50 years. $10 trillion. Now that starts to sound like a deficit comparable to the federal deficit. And believe me, it is the problem to be addressed at the state and local level. And what they find is what's driving this structural deficit, this long-run deficit, are basically the rising health care costs associated with Medicaid, the unfunded liabilities in pension programs, and the unfunded liabilities in retiree health benefits offered by state and local governments. And let me suggest that this is the fundamental problem in Montana. It's not just making up this $400 million, it is addressing this long-run structural deficit. Now today I want to talk about what I think Montana can do to solve this problem. And the first thing you do, need to do is change the way you budget. We call this budgeting for results. And uh, if, if Carl has me set up here, I should be able to get you to the next slide. Maybe not. <laughs> oh. Carl, where's Carl? <laughs> Okay, at any rate, I'm going to forget my slide for a moment and talk to you. Randy's, Randy's high tech, he'll solve my computer problem. Okay. <clears throat> this, which key is it? This one? Ah, okay. All right. Thank you, Carl. Well, I think Randy solved my problem. Okay. What Montana needs to do is introduce priority budgeting. And you need to understand the difference between priority budgeting and what your state does now. What your state does now is called traditional budgeting. And it's very simple. Traditional budgeting, you take last year's budget, last year's expenditures, you add inflation and caseload increases, and that forms your base for the next year's budget. And then, as you are this year, if you have a deficit and you're trying to make up $400 million, the question is, how can we cut programs to make up $400 million in deficit? And maybe you take a look at a couple new programs. Uh, that is a fundamentally flawed way to budget. We call this iceberg budgeting because you're just looking at the tip of the iceberg. You're only looking at a few programs that are going to be cut or new programs. You don't look at the iceberg. So how do you look at the iceberg? Well, a number of states have introduced what's called priority budgeting, very successfully. One of the most successful is your neighbor, Washington. And we use Washington as a model for priority budgeting. Now, the first thing you do in priority budgeting is instead, of, you don't let the budget be determined by bureaucrats. That's the first, <laughs> first thing you don't do. <laughs> Uh, which is, by the way, what I observe happening in Montana. What you need to do is get some experts involved in this budgeting process, not only experts in the government, in the executive branch, and in, in the legislative branch, but experts in the private sector, 
I know you, the, the, the Chamber of Commerce here and CPAs are going around the state talking about budgeting issues. Get them involved. And what states have done is actually form a budget review commission which includes people like yourselves from the private sector, CPAs, business people, people who are experts in budgeting, working with the experts in the legislative and executive branch, and step back from this and take an objective look at the budget in Montana. And the first question you should ask, and which is asked in these states that have implemented this, is what should the government do? What should the results be? Not what should the input be? Not how much is each agency spending? What do we expect state government in Montana to do? Now, it's interesting. There are more than half a dozen states have implemented this, and they actually come up with a, a, a common set of basic core functions that the state should perform. And this is the list that Washington came up with, and it shouldn't be too surprising. What we expect state governments to do is deliver certain services in terms of education, health, the security of vulnerable citizens, uh, transportation, public safety, natural resources, cultural and recreational activities, and of course, importantly, delivering government services efficiently. Now once you've identified these core functions of government, the, the budget review process should be around each of these core functions. In other words, let's say you have a legislative review commission that's supposed to be looking at the budget. You should have a legislative committee looking at public safety, a legislative committee looking at health and so forth. And they should be working with this group of experts. And the organization of the reviews should be around each of these core functions. So, uh, the next, the next question is, how do we deliver these core functions, these core government services efficiently, and uh, how do we go about delivering the services? Now, this is important. Every state agency should be required to review every single program, not just the tip of the iceberg, but every single program that the state government delivers, and every one of those programs should answer these questions. What is the service provided? Are these essential services? What are these services? Are they needed? Who are they delivered for? Are they delivered efficiently? And you need some metrics, some measures of efficiency to answer that question. And then what that review commission or committee should do is rank these programs from the most effective to the least effective. Now let me give you an example in the state of Washington. By the way, they eliminated 3.8 billion deficit by using this priority budgeting process. So we know it works. So let me tell you what, how they, they go about this. I'll use public safety as an example. We would all agree that a core function of the state government is public safety, the safety of citizens, the safety of property. And of course, there are lots of services that the state delivers to achieve that core objective. One of them, of course, is recidivism. How do we reduce recidivism? And uh, obviously, if we can reduce recidivism, we can improve public safety. Okay, what you do is ask every program in the state that purports to, to reduce recidivism to submit this type of evaluation. What services are you providing? There, this may be education, job training, job placement, uh, counseling. There may be all sorts of different services that various programs deliver designed to reduce recidivism. And each of them should be required to report exactly these criteria. Now what you have now is a basis for evaluating every program and ranking them from the most effective to the least effective. And when Washington did this, I can tell you that the results were very interesting. I mean, there are some very effective programs that actually significantly reduce recidivism. There are other programs that are less effective, and there are some programs that are not effective at all. We even found one program in Colorado that increased recidivism. 
Now, I, I know that's hard to believe, but they had some sort of, I don't know, was some sort of peer review by drug, drug addicts for young people. I don't know. It increased recidivism. You don't, you don't, want, you don't want to fund something that does, that, that's in conflict with your objective. Okay? So now you've got some evidence. Now you have a basis for ranking these programs and deciding, okay, if we have a limited budget, what programs are going to be funded, what are not going to be funded, the key is a cut line. There's a budget cut line for each of these areas, in each of these areas. Okay, so the next step in your priority budgeting is how do you allocate revenues to these various programs? Well, of course, the first thing is to determine how much revenue you have and also how much revenue is available. Now, the key here is you need a comprehensive budget. Everything is on the table. All revenues, all expenditures. This is a fatal flaw in Montana. Almost half of your budget is off budget. You don't even look at it. I'll come back to that. You need a comprehensive budget in which everything is there. All total revenues. Run it like a business. If you were running a business, you would want to know what all your revenue is, all of your expenditure. Run your state government like a business. Look at all your revenues, all your expenditures. No earmarks, no privileged trust funds, no privileged revenue funds, no privileged position for any interest group in the state. Every group must be evaluated critically. Okay, so now we've got all of our revenues. And then the question is, how should that revenue be allocated among these various programs? Well, the first thing to do, of course, again, use your core functions. We're going to allocate X amount to public health. We're going to allocate X amount of this revenue to public safety, education, and so forth. And now, this is the key where your, your review commission, your review committees are crucial. You've given them an X budget for public safety, and that review committee is going to decide, okay, with this budget, how much can we, how much should we allocate to these programs? And they're ranked. We know what the most effective are, and down to the least effective, and we have a budget line, and programs above the budget line get funded, programs below the fund budget line don't get funded. Now, that doesn't mean they don't deliver services. It doesn't mean that they don't have good people involved, but they simply are not delivering services as efficiently or effectively as programs above the budget line. And, of course, as you go through this process, you can certainly reassess and you can say, all right, well, let's take another look at this program below the budget line. And recidivism, uh, we put, for example, one of the programs to reduce recidivism is aromatherapy. Now, I question aromatherapy, but let's say that, you know, you. you <laughs> Here's aromatherapy, reduces recidivism. Maybe that should be above the cut line. Okay, if we move aromatherapy above the cut line, that means that we move something else, job training or something else, below the cut line. But now, now we have an effective budget. Okay, so every review committee has done this in each of these core areas, and then you, now you have your legislative finance committee, your house finance committee, bring all this together and look at all the trade-offs and again if your if your house finance committee thinks that well maybe we should boost some programs in in public safety to do that they have to eliminate some programs some in some other core areas now let me tell you one of the, I drove up here yesterday and I got in early enough to watch a television program one of the most frustrating television programs I've ever watched in my life. It was your House Finance Committee meeting last night. Did any of you watch that? <laughs> if you want to be depressed, watch your House fin Finance Committee in action. It exhibits all the flaws that I've described. Be and what, I'll tell you, what, <laughs> I want to talk about pension reform. One of the things they discussed was supposed to be pension reform. So, and I, some bureaucrat was reporting and they and the House Finance Committee said, well, first of all, what's the magnitude of our unfunded liabilities in our pension system? And the bureaucrat reporting said, well, 
I know it's in there, the, the, the data's in there somewhere, but I don't know, it's, it's the two, two uh, billion or something about, I don't, I don't know, but I can get that for you. I'll track that down for you. And then there was some discussion of possible reforms of your pension program. And this person, the bureaucrat who was reporting it said, well, we had some, we've held some hearings out there and we've heard from the teachers unions and we've heard from the, 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 uh, uh, some public sector interest groups and so forth, and they've suggested that uh, maybe we should just continue to assume an 8% return on our assets and hope for the best. <laughs> and, and then, and then uh, they said, well, another, pro, another, another reform we're considering is, whoop. I'm going to move this just a little. Oh, I'm sorry. Another, they the, said the reform that the teachers union really liked was we just increase employer contributions 1% per year and employee contributions 1% per year, and we keep doing that until the problem goes away. And, <laughs> you know, this is, this is very typical of what happens in these, the, when, you, when you let the bureaucrats and the interest groups set the agenda, you're in trouble. And you're in trouble in Montana because you need to take control of this budget. So the next step in this budget process is, let's say you've got your priority budget process in place now. How do you make sure it works in the long run? Well, this is not a one-shot affair. This is a continuing assessment of your budget on a long-term basis. And to make sure that these programs deliver what they say they're going to do, you have to introduce performance-based budgeting. What does that mean? All right, let's say that you've done this analysis of recidivism, you've funded certain programs to reduce recidivism, and they say they're going to reduce recidivism 10% over the next two years. Okay, next year, two years, you evaluate. Did they succeed? Did they accomplish their objective? Did they do it efficiently? Did they accomplish what they said they, they were doing? Which programs worked? Which programs didn't work? which program should be expanded, which should be cut back. And what you discover, of course, is there are all sorts of opportunities for budget savings. When you do this type of analysis, you find that there's tremendous duplication in various programs that purport to, for example, reduce recidivism. There are opportunities for reducing costs by privatizing, contracting out, uh, uh, consolidating programs, the, the, the budget process should have results of that type where you're actually reforming government. Uh, some states, in fact, Colorado was an innovator in sunset advisory commissions. Every state agency should be reviewed at some point to decide, does it, should it even exist? Maybe it had a purpose 10 years ago, but now there's no purpose. We've actually closed down some government agencies uh, through this sunset advisory process. And then finally, a competitive servicing, a sourcing center. The state that has mo been most successful in this is Florida. And essentially this is an independent commission charged with privatizing government programs. They solicit bids from the private sector, they encourage private businesses that can offer services more efficiently to come in and bid on them, and each year they come up with a, a list of government programs that are going to be uh, uh, privatized or contracted out and so forth. A very, very successful program. Okay, so let's say that we've, we've, we now have priority budgeting in Montana. We now have the budget process in place that will accomplish our objectives. And what I want to talk about finally are what I call the fatal flaws in the Montana budget. And as I said, I think one of the most important flaws in Montana is off-budget expenditures. You don't have a comprehensive budget. Uh, Carl and his staff have estimated the off-budget expenditures at over a billion dollars per year. Some others would estimate it even higher. What it means is almost half your budget is never even analyzed. It's that part of the budget that is uh, not subject to the ordinary budget review. Now, actually, one of the 
good things that your legislative staff has done in Montana is actually help you to begin to get a handle on this. And they've actually started to go through your budget and to identify not only what some of these off-budget expenditures are, but why they are having a negative impact on your budget. And one of the examples they use is transportation. <clears throat> you have a transportation revenue fund that is separate. And the way you've operated that transportation revenue fund is a disaster because essentially it's used to maximize federal highway revenues. What's wrong with that? Well, what it means is there's some years when you're running up that expenditures for transportation and highways very rapidly and other years where, uh, and, and in fact, far in excess of the budget, the revenue you have available for highways, which means that you cut into that revenue fund, which means that in later years, now you don't have enough money <clears throat> to cover the, even your priority transportation projects. Uh, so you get lots of volatility. Uh, you create problems for future legislators that must deal with this, with these, this underfunding. And most importantly, you don't have any control of your highway spending. I know this in Colorado because we have exactly the same problem. In fact, you've heard of the, of the bridge to nowhere. We have both a bridge to nowhere and a bridge for no one. Now, <laughs> You have to, it's hard to believe, but Ken Salazar, actually his, 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 Congressman Salazar, Salazar, who's from the Western Slope, decided we need to build this bridge over a river south of Grand, Grand Junction. And this is an earmark. And so he, by God, was going to get this money for this earmark in his district. Well, now, the Department of Transportation, the head of the department, issued a report saying this proposed bridge is not a priority. In fact, it is not even on our list of projects to be funded. Nonetheless, this, and, and we have no plans to build a road on the other side of the bridge. <laughs> Guess what? They built a bridge and there's no road on the other side of the bridge. So we have our own bridge to nowhere. But the more interesting one, the one I love, is, is Mark Udall decided that we have a problem with elk in Colorado and elk crossing I-70. Now, we already have a series of tunnels for the elk to go under I-70. What Mark Udall decided is, we need a bridge for elk. We need a way for them to get over I-70. And honest to God, this is true. And uh, this is actually true. Now, I was talking with, our, with your, your, uh, your uh, speaker for lunch, and he said, well, that's a great idea. Me and my buddies were... We'll stand on the other side of the tunnel and we'll, we'll be ready for those elk, you know. <laughs> you, don't want, you don't want an elk tunnel or an elk bridge. You don't need an elk bridge. What's happening is you don't have any control over your transportation spending because these bureaucrats and politicians in Washington are setting your priorities. The people in Montana should set the priorities for transportation spending, highway spending in Montana. Now, the first thing you're going to say is, oops, well, now we have a problem. What if we don't maximize federal highway dollars if we set our own priorities? So what? So what? The answer to that is just say no. We're going to decide how to allocate transportation dollars, not bureaucrats, not politicians. We know what's in our best interest much better than you do. Better yet, join a number of states, and by the way, Alec has some model legislation Demand that you keep your dollars here. You don't need to send those highway dollars, those gas tax dollars to, to, to uh, the federal government. Shut the Federal Department of Transportation down. Keep your dollars here and spend them the way you want to spend them. That's a serious proposition to think about. A number of states are already moving in that direction. Okay, Medicaid. This is something that is not on your radar, and I suggest you get it on your radar as quickly as possible. There is now a huge unfunded mandate from the federal government to spend Medicaid dollars coming from the stimulus bill and this recent health reform bill. Now, the reason it's not on your radar is that part of the quid pro quo here is that the federal government is going to pick up most of the cost of Medicaid for several years here, and 
initially as we move into the next decade. And so it doesn't show up as a deficit in your budget right now. In 2011, Medicaid spending in this state is projected to increase 30 percent. And the reason is those federal dollars disappear. Worse yet, that federal legislation has maintenance of effort and requirements, mandates, that essentially say you have to increase your, uh, the population eligible for Medicaid, you have to increase your services provided to them in order to get these federal Medicaid dollars. This is going to create a hole in every single state budget. And indeed, one estimate that is that this is the unfunded mandate is equal to one and a half trillion dollars over the next decade. So this is going to be a very serious problem for you to address. And what really bothers me is that because of this, all the success we've had over the last decade in reforming Medicaid is going to go out the window. A number of states have had really a good deal of success. And in fact, this is what I suggest Montana do. And that is reform Medicaid. South Carolina is one of the most successful states. They said to the federal government, give us a waiver. We want to design our own Medicaid program, which they did. One of the first things they discovered is one out of every three, every three Medicaid bills is fraudulent. They were never audited. So the first thing to do is audit these bills. And then what they did was set up a health savings account for Medicaid recipients that they can use to pay for their health care costs and their health insurance and to contract with health providers to deliver these Medicaid services. And they've had success in reducing costs in delivering better quality health care services to Medicaid. Much of this reform will go out the window if we let this happen. Obviously, one response to this, and again, a response you might think about, just say no. The state of Utah, Wayne Niederhauser, who is going to be uh, carrying this legislation, in Utah, they're just going to say no. We're going to go it alone. We are not going to satisfy these mandates, these unfunded mandates. We, are, we don't want your money. We are going to fund our Medicaid program with our own state dollars. You ought to think about that. My guess is Carl, in fact, is going to be doing a study. We think that in, in Montana that if you did that, it will be a wash. Your costs will be about the same as if you continue muddling along with this failed Medicaid program. Well, the final thing I want to talk about, which in some ways is the most important, is pension and retiree health care reform. Again, the magnitude of unfunded liabilities in these programs is hard to believe. At a minimum of $3 trillion of unfunded liabilities today in pension plans, retiree pension plans. One and a half billion, a trillion dollars, excuse me, get my numbers mixed up at the federal level. One and a half trillion dollars in unfunded liabilities in retiree health programs for state and local governments. Now, You've seen, again, the tip of the iceberg here. What's been reported to you are unfunded liabilities in your pension and retiree health plan, a little over $2 billion of unfunded liabilities in the pension plan, over half a billion dollars in your retiree health plan. Let me suggest that that is vastly underestimating the magnitude of the problem. And there, there are several reasons for that. One is... There's a so-called smoothing technique. All these losses they've, they've incurred over the last year, they don't show up in your budget this year. They're going to be spread out over your budget over the next few years. So you're looking at unfunded liabilities for the foreseeable future. And secondly, as I mentioned earlier, you make a, a, an incredibly unrealistic assumption about the rate of return on assets in your pension fund. If you assume 8% return, that is simply unrealistic. Economists have spent a lot of time analyzing this, and the best estimates are you should be assuming a rate of return less than half of that, something closer to bond yields or some other yields in, in the private sector. If you do that, I can tell you the unfunded liabilities are much larger 
than anything that's been reported to you. More importantly, what economists project is even if you were to return an 8% return on the assets in that pension fund, what they still project is you're going to continue to incur unfunded liabilities and great volatility. Indeed, what they project is a number of these state pension funds and retiree health funds are going to go bankrupt within the next decade, California being an obvious example. So, what should you do? Run it like a business. What have businesses been doing for two decades? Businesses have basically said over the last couple of decades, we cannot afford the generous pension, defined benefit pension plans, the, the generous retiree health plans. We simply can't afford it. We can't compete. And so for two decades now, in the private sector, what businesses have done is essentially replace these defined benefit pension plans with defined contribution pension plans. In the case of retiree health plans, most businesses do not provide retiree health benefits to their employees. If they do, most of them now have a voluntary program in which the employee pays the full pension insurance uh, premium. Well, we're only beginning to see this in the public sector, but again, what Montana needs to do is take a look at some states that have had some success in these reforms. In the case of pension reform, there are two states that have replaced their defined benefit plan with a defined contribution plan, Alaska and Michigan. Alaska for all employees, state employees, teachers, everybody. In the case of Michigan, for state employees. A number of states, more than half a dozen states, have replaced their defined benefit plan. They've closed the defined benefit plan to new employees. And what they offer new employees is a hybrid defined benefit, defined contribution plan. They've also, a number of states, of course, have significantly reduced benefits for current employees uh, in, their, in their pension system. And I've actually looked at the numbers. The states that have enacted these reforms are making progress in reducing unfunded liabilities. Uh, even more so, in the case of retiree health plans. And this is something which isn't even on your radar. I've looked through a lot of your budget documents. Nobody's talking about your retiree health plan. $600 million in unfunded liabilities now, let me tell you, that is increasing very rapidly. Last year, you, uh, the cost of your retiree health plan on an annual basis doubled, which means that your unfunded liabilities doubled last year. This is something which is increasing very rapidly. It's going to be a major source of your structural deficit. You need to reform your retiree health plan. There again, look at the success of some other states. And here, many states have done what the private sector has done. They have begun to replace their defined benefit retiree health plan with a defined contribution plan. One of the most successful is your neighbor, Idaho. And in the study that I provided today, we talk about the Idaho reform. Basically what the Idaho legislators did, they asked their staff to project what's going to happen to these unfunded liabilities in the retiree health plan. And the numbers were pretty staggering. And I suggest you ask your legislators to do the same. Project what's going to happen to these unfunded liabilities and get the hard numbers. Don't have somebody wander into your hearing and say, oh, I, I think those numbers are in some report and I can track them down for you. Demand that they give you the numbers you need to make the decisions. And you're going to find that that, the, that is a program you must address right now. You can't wait for something to happen. What Idaho did was basically close their defined benefit plan to new employees. What they did for current employees was to adopt a, a plan where the state puts in X dollars. They capped it at $155 is what the state will pay for health insurance premiums for their retirees. And the retiree then pays most of the health insurance premium. They, uh, new employees are not eligible for retire, the right, retiree health plan. Retirees who reach the age of 65 and are eligible for Medicare are no longer eligible for the state retiree health plan. These reforms, changing eligibility, 
Adopting a defined contribution plan have enabled Idaho to significantly reduce the unfunded liabilities in that plan. They are now contributing more than is required. They are on track to pay off those unfunded liabilities within the required 30-year time frame. So these are reforms that can work, <clears throat> reforms that, that, that need to be introduced. Uh, I think that what this last election has signaled is that Taxpayers in every state, including Montana, are no longer willing to do business as usual and allow your legislature to muddle along with the current budgetary system. If you want to begin to address this problem, you need to introduce priority budgeting, and then you need to tack, tackle these fatal flaws, off-budget expenditures, unfunded liabilities in your pension and, and OPEB plan, and the unfunded mandate coming at you from Medicaid. You have a window of opportunity, and I'm not exaggerating. I think if you act now to address this structural deficit, it's manageable. It may be hard. It's going to be difficult to confront the, the stakeholders and to enact these reforms. But if you do it, you're going to get the fiscal policies of the state on track in the long run. Fiscal stability. You can, you can now begin to plan for the future. If you fail to do it in this election cycle, the problems become more formidable, many would argue insurmountable, both at the state and the federal level, if we don't act now in this, at this, uh, in, over this next electoral cycle. Okay, let me stop and ask if, uh, if there are any questions. <clears throat> yes, sir. I, I can, I, I'll repeat your question if you... Well, we're, we're recording it, too. Yeah, oh, okay. Just ask yours and he'll repeat it. In other states, could you name three key areas where savings could be created by privatizing government services? Sure. Uh, I, I'm an educator. I teach at the University of Colorado, and I can tell you from my own experience, in higher education, there are ample opportunities for privatizing what higher education does. Everything, recreation, uh, food services, housing. The University of Colorado is the worst manager of housing. Privatize housing for students. Uh, you can contract out a lot of education services. So that, that's my own experience. And, and of course, if you, if you look at the experience of states that have had the most success here, uh, I mentioned Florida. Uh, one of the things that I think is, has been very successful around the country is privatizing transportation, joint public-private partnerships to develop transportation projects. Instead of having the government build highways and, and other transportation facilities, enter into partnerships with the private sector to develop transportation projects. Uh, I mentioned recidivism. There are a lot of programs where the private sector can do a lot better job in terms of job training, job placement, counseling, than having some government agency, some bureaucracy provide that, that service. But I think, I think when you look at the states that have implemented this, uh, there are opportunities for contracting out and privatizing in virtually every single state program. I'm uh, the past transportation director for the previous um, governor, and I, I don't work in the administration in this administration, so I don't really have a horse in the race. But I agree with quite a bit of what you've said, and, and I do, though, however, want to close the loop on some of the transportation funding comments for the benefit of those here. And first of all, I got a comment and then kind of two questions. From a Montana perspective on, on excise taxes for gas and things like that to go into the transportation program, it's in our constitution that those go into highway maintenance and construction, so it would need to have a constitutional protection, so question, or a constitutional change. So my first question would be, did that happen in Washington, and did they take all the excise tax money from gas and registration fees and, and trucks and put that on budget um, for the whole state? And then secondly, the idea of devolution and change in the federal highway funding formula has been around for quite some time, and I think in 
fairness to the comments about sending the feds back their share of the money and letting them keep that, I think you ought to talk a little bit about the donor donee relationship and the fact that Montana and many other rural states are donors and what that would actually mean to the citizens of Montana if, if an idea like that was carried forward. Well, to take your last question or comment first, I think that's especially important in a state like Montana. If you're a donor state, it means you're sending more to Washington than you get back. So they're ripping off some of that to, for whatever the bureaucracy does there. But I think, I think what the diversion that we see in transportation funding is that most of you, when you drive down the highways in Montana and you pay that excise tax for gas, you think, okay, well, I don't like paying a tax, but at least it's coming back to, to improve the highway, build new highways. Not true. A large share, a large chunk of that money goes for non-highway transportation. And, of course, you, can, you know a lot of that is urban mass transit. Now, uh, I'm not sure if anybody else is going to be talking about mass transit, uh, but... If you want to waste tax dollars, look at every single subsidized mass transit pro Actually, Randy's going to be, <laughs> what am I talking about? Randy is the expert on mass transit. He's going to give you song and verse about the waste of tax dollars in transportation, especially in mass transit. So especially in a state like Montana, look around. I mean, you don't, you're not seeing a lot of those federal dollars spent for mass transit in Montana. Uh, so, uh, and then to bring it home to this, to your own budget, as I say, I was actually impressed with your legislative staff had done a nice job of saying, well, here's this transportation revenue fund, and it's not being managed properly. And it's a source of deficits in the long run because it, we run up that, our expenditures very rapidly in some years, we run them down in other years, mainly to, to track, to trail, or try to capture federal dollars. That is not an efficient way to allocate transportation dollars. And I, I'm, I'm not going to talk about transportation more because Randy is going to, he is the expert par excellence on transportation. And he will tell you better than I can how you should be spending your transportation dollars. Well, we're, we'll pass the mic over here. Uh, we're actually a donee state. We get about a buck 47 for every dollar we send to Washington. But that dollar forty-seven comes back with a lot of strings, and we're looking at Medicaid specifically. If we refused that money and got rid of the mandates and did our own system, could we maintain the required level of services using just state funds and not be at the beck and call of the feds and, and participate in those huge increases that are down the road? So we'll be looking at that separately at MPI, and we also have a mass transit study that Randy or Randall O'Toole did for us. It's back here if you're interested in mass transit in Montana and the impacts of that. Over here. Professor, I really enjoyed your presentation very much. And when you were talking about putting everything on the table, I don't think there's any way around the school trust fund issue, is there? In other words, when the Enabling Act said 16 and 36 in each uh, township were going to be used for education, had to be used. Is there, I don't see any way around it. Is there one? Well, uh, it may be that it does require constitutional change. It's, it, perhaps that is the ultimate answer to that question, that if this is a barrier to efficient spending for education, uh, so be it. Let's, let's take a look at the constitutional reform here. But, but independent of constitutional reform, uh, I, I took a look at your education budget. And first of all, there's a complete lack of transparency. One of the problems is you've got these different funds floating around funding education, and it, it's very, very difficult for taxpayers in the state to answer the question, how much are we spending, what's the outcome, and the emphasis should be on outcomes. It shouldn't be on how, how are we spending enough dollars in education. The, uh, the emphasis should be on are we improving performance. And the interesting fact that I find is that one of the states that has the best performance in its education system is Arizona. And the reason is not because they're spending more, they're actually spending less per student than you do, a lot less than you do. But they have vigorously pursued school choice, vouchers, uh, charter schools. Uh, in Colorado, we now have a school district that is going to introduce a new voucher system. Uh, and accountability here means that the education lobby in this state should be subject to the same standards of any other state spending. What services do you deliver? 
Do you deliver them efficiently? Can you show you're improving the performance of students? They don't answer that question. And usually the explanation is, well, we really can't address the problem because it's all off budget. Nonsense. Put it on budget. And if that means change the Constitution, so be it. Well, Professor, you're preaching to the choir, but the Enabling Act that established Montana required us to use this money from these sections for education. And uh, it's tough to get around. I just wondered if any other state had tried to get around that. The See, it's not our Constitution. It's the Enabling Act that established the state of Montana in 1889. I guess I can't answer that. I, I'm not a constitutional expert. Uh, but I know that, that other states have begun to address the problem. And in some cases, this does require changing the rules of the game. And, and change, if it means changing the constitutional provisions, so be it. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> professor, or professor, I think that in Montana and the education issue, this was the issue that I was going to look at, it states in our Constitution that it's basically a self-governing power to local school boards, and this is what's been ignored by state mandates. Not only do we have a federal mandate problem, but a bigger problem is this whole Board of Education mandates coming down to irrelevant. We're spending between $10,000 to $40,000 per student in the state, and it's being driven by the state regulations coming down and yet within the Constitution there is a provision that says that all decisions running the school should rest with the local trustees and that's being ignored and I think a small statutory change could of giving self-governing power to local schools and block grinding the money back to local schools would solve 90 percent of this waste of money in the education system. I agree with you in fact I don't know if Lisa is here from the, the the Reason Foundation, but Lisa is going to be talking about education reform later on. Believe it or not, this is absolutely, I found this very interesting. We had dinner last night, and she was talking about reforming education in Los Angeles. If you think you have a problem of reforming education, <laughs> you know what, her, what she said is, it's almost impossible for them to reform things at the state level. It's that, that state government is basically not functional. But in the city of Los Angeles, they started a charter school movement, and the first opening the time they opened the school, they had 5,000 <coughs> students and families apply for the charter school that was opening up, 5,000. My perception is that the grassroots gets it. People get it. They want to control their schools. They want to make sure their kids are educated, even in downtown Los Angeles. And I, my advice to you is go to the people, go to the grassroots and say, take control of your education system. As you're suggesting, maybe this means let's return control to local school districts and keep the state out of it and allow those local school, school districts to make the teachers accountable for improving the quality. If they, if they don't, fire them, shut them down. We're trying to do that in Colorado, not very successfully. If schools can't guarantee the safety of students, shut them down. Shut them down. I'm sorry for ranting and raving. That, thank Carl, you, Barry. That's my <laughs> All right, we're going to take a 15-minute uh, break here. Uh, you can continue this conversation out in the hallway. We'll be starting again promptly at 10.15. Randall O'Toole is going to come up and talk about property rights, land use issues, and uh, then Mike Tanner, health care reform after that.